This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. trying to move towards the idea of identifying targeted treatments for neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, whether that's autism spectrum disorders or fragile X syndrome, which we consider to be a genetic model for autism. And the reason for that is just currently the only FDA approved medications that we have for treating anything related to these disorders are really symptomatic treatments. And what I mean by that is that these are medications that are helping some of the associated but not core symptoms of autism, for example, so the social communication deficits, or the repetitive and restricted behaviors, or um, in Fragile X syndrome, some of the known molecular aberrations that we are aware of. Um, so currently, we have tools like um, SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They work well for treating some of the anxiety that many children on the spectrum or with Fragile X syndrome have. But again, it's not treating the core symptoms. Um, as anyone who was in this room for the last two sessions um, is aware of stimulants and other non-stimulant medications like the antihypertensives are pretty good at treating um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And you know, for a lot of the kids with developmental disabilities that have a lot of irritability or aggression or any of those uh, difficult behaviors, atypical, anti atypical antipsychotics, things like Risperdal, um, are currently FDA approved. And these are also, it's also important to keep in mind that these should be used in addition to the behavioral and educational interventions and therapies that are available that we know work and have a good evidence base. Um, because if you think about ADHD, for example, uh, medications can really help you attend better and focus and learn better, but it's not going to help you learn if you're not given those inputs. So it really is important to be having that environmental um, exposures and the educational components of learning in order to make progress. And so that's where we're currently at, and what we want to try to move towards is getting more at targeted treatments, so treating the core symptoms of the disorder or treating very specific known aberrations in some of the molecular mechanisms that we know about, either through animal models or some of the human trials that we'll be talking about. Um, so this is just up here to show that there are many genes that we know are involved at in increasing risk for autism spectrum disorders. Um, Fragile X, which is the one I'll be focusing on in this talk, is just one of them. That's related here to the FMRP, the Fragile X Mental Retardation Protein. But there are many other genetic disorders than c that can help shed light on underlying mechanisms that might be uh, relating to causes or susceptibility for autism. Things like Rett syndrome, that's the MECP2, or um, tuberous sclerosis or neurofibromatosis. But um, today we're focusing in mostly on uh, Fragile X. So why study Fragile X? Um, there is some overlap in some of the things that we know have gone awry in different systems that are involved in autism spectrum disorders, Fragile X, and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So one that's very important and what we're trying to target in many of our medication trials is um, the synapse formation and synaptic plasticity. And what, what I mean by that is the synapses are really the way that your neurons communicate with each other. Um, and so that formation is really important. And we'll see how some medications, like minocycline, for example, can really help strengthen some of the quality of those connections. And then synaptic plasticity, again, is um, on the similar topic of how the neurons communicate with, e with each other, of how strong those connections are, or which ones stick and which ones disappear and go away. That's really important for learning and for behavior. Um, 
the balance between ex excitation and inhibition, we know, um, is a problem in many of these neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, that's why sometimes epilepsy and seizures are seen more commonly. There's an increased risk there. So trying to uh, correct that imbalance is one target uh, that we look at for medications. Um, brain connectivity, which uh, I think in the next session in one of the rooms, um, Christine Nordahl through the Autism Phenome Project will be talking about some of those research findings and differences in how the brain, different parts of the brain connect to each other and talk to each other. And then other areas that can also be um, dysfunctional in these disorders include mitochondrial dysfunction. So your mitochondria are the cellular components that are responsible for making energy for your body. Um, oxidative stress and neuro neuronal cell death. And many of these problems are also present in neurodegenerative disorders, not just neurodevelopmental disorders. So things such as Parkinson's, um, Alzheimer's disease, and FAXTAS, which is the fragile X tremor associated syndrome. It's um, a neurological disorder that affects more elderly um, individuals with fragile X mutations, and they generally have problems with their gait, that's the tremor, ataxia part, um, as well as a dementia. So why is Fragile X syndrome a good model for autism? Uh, many individuals with Fragile X have autism or are on the autism spectrum. So 30%, um, you know, if we look at DSM-4 criteria, would have met criteria for the full autistic syndrome. 30% um, would be more mildly affected or PDDNOS. Um, and it's the most frequent single gene cause of autism that we know about. And even though it is the most frequent one, it only accounts for two to six percent of children with autism that actually have Fragile X syndrome. So that just really goes to show um, how much more we need to learn about the genetics uh, that contribute to autism susceptibility. Uh, but because of this and because of the fact that uh, Fragile X syndrome really does affect multiple people in a family, it is quite inherited. Um, part of the medical workup for a child who's been diagnosed on the autism spectrum often involves genetic testing, including Fragile X syndrome. Um, other similarities include macrocephaly, or big heads. So uh, there are subgroups of children with autism who seem to have a rapid uh, period of growth in their brains in early childhood. And one of the um, physical features of Fragile X syndrome includes macrocephaly as well. Uh, both syndromes can have problems with hyperarousal as well as anxiety, and so there's overlap there. And then we do see some difficulties with facial processing. So many individuals with Fragile X are gaze avoidant. Um, many of them talk to, looking down all the time, and that's really a lot related to their social anxiety. Uh, and we see the same problem in a lot of face tracking studies and where people, how people with autism use their eyes is that they often avoid the eye area, which is where most of us tend to look at when we're talking to people in social communications. Um, so the Fragile X mental retardation protein is a very important protein that's needed in normal development. And so um, it controls the translation of many other genes that are associated with autism. And the latest estimate um, is that as many as 50% of genes responsible for autism are affected or regulated by the FMRP protein. So FMRP has many functions, and when it's not present, which is the case in the full mutation of Fragile X syndrome, um, there is dysregulation of several systems that are known to be associated with autism. So as I mentioned a couple slides ago, proteins related to synaptic plasticity. Um, here, again, just a little picture to kind of give you an idea of um, how the neurons are kind of um, communicating with each other once sending out a message and the other one's receiving it. Um, and then that balance between excitation and inhibition is off. So you see too much excitation um, through the glutamate pathways, that's what the mGluR5 stands for, metabotropic glutamate receptor 5 pathways. Um, and then too little or down regulation of some of the inhibitory pathways involving GABA. And so here's just a picture showing that we really want these to be nicely balanced, not too much of one, not too little of the other. Um, other neurotransmitter systems that could be awry include dopamine as well as um, oxidative stress and damage to neurons. So many pathways can lead to autism and I'm really just focusing in on a small portion of that today. And here are some of the different agents we'll be talking about. 
Um, so again, going back to that imbalance between excitation and inhibition involving glutamate and GABA, um, We'll be talking about arbaclofen that works on GABA and then some of the mglur 5 antagonists. And by antagonists, I mean blockers. Um, minocycline is another study medication, actually one that's available for different uses um, that can affect the way that synapses are sh shaped and formed. Um, and then any uh, abnormalities with serotonin could possibly be leading to OCD type symptoms or repetitive behaviors. So these are all potential targets that may help improve some of the symptoms we see with autism spectrum disorders. So a little bit about Fragile X syndrome. Um, it is, has a prevalence of about 1 in 3,600 to 1 in 4,000 live births. And as I mentioned before, it's the leading inherited cause of intellectual disability. So many people are aware of Down syndrome, uh, but that tends to happen sporadically and isn't something that's necessarily passed along through families. Uh, Fragile X is quite different. Um, it is passed along on the X chromosome, so boys are affected more than girls are because they only have one X. Um, and generally speaking, they may get it from, uh, more likely to get it from their mothers. Um, and it does affect many other people in the family. While they may not have the full mutation or Fragile X syndrome, there are milder forms of it involved called the premutation, and that has other consequences, not necessarily related to autism or intellectual disability, but increased um, susceptibility to anxiety disorders and autoimmune disease, and for, um, as people get more in the elderly age range, the neurological condition, FAXTAS. So it is important if someone in the family, a child usually is identified with Fragile X syndrome, that really usually cause, um, ca uh, causes what's called cascade testing, so that other people in the family should then be tested because um, there are a lot of preventative measures we can take. Um, as I mentioned before, it's the leading single gene cause associated with autism. And um, for people with Fragile X syndrome, which is also called the full mutation, it leads to decreased levels of FMRP. So there are certain behaviors that are associated with Fragile X, including autism spectrum disorders, anxiety, as we mentioned, hyperactivity can be very common. Uh, many of these individuals have some self-injurious behaviors where they do a lot of hand or arm biting. There can be a lot of aggression, and if you stick around for the cases that we show in the next session, you'll see um, a child who had problems with that. And mood instability and irritability can also be quite severe. And oftentimes these children end up on many medications to try to help ameliorate these problems. There's also a physical phenotype that can help clue in clinicians or um, other people working with children who have intellectual disabilities that maybe uh, an investigation for Fragile X syndrome might make sense. Um, so these kids, as I mentioned before, may tend to have larger heads. Um, they may have low muscle tone, hypotonia. Uh, loose connective tissue can result in having flat feet or very lax joints where they may have joint dislocations. Um, they also tend to have a soft quality to their skin. And the hypotonia in combination with the loose connective tissue um, often um, shows up with a high arched palate top of the, top of the roof of the mouth. Um, ears can be prominent, which you can see a little bit with this child here. And then um, post-puberty in males, there's um, macroorganism or enlargement of the testes. Uh, it's also important to note, though, that 30% of individuals who have Fragile X syndrome may not have these typical physical features. And so for anyone who's working with a child with disabilities, um, it's good to think about these things because so, some of these physical signs might not be there, and you may be the one to help really help a child and their family with a diagnosis. So um, there are many different targeted treatments for Fragile X syndrome, and by extension, many of them are now being looked at in autism as well. Uh, we're, we're gonna focus here on the GABA system and the glutamate system, as well as minocycline. So starting with the glutamate system, the metabotropic glutamate receptor antagonists or blockers. So like as I mentioned before, um, we need fragile X mental retardation protein around for normal synaptic development. And in fragile X syndrome, we have low FMRP, and that leads to increased glutamate activity. And then what happens with that is then with the increased glutamate activity, you get kind of these weak connections in the synapses, and they're not as efficient. And what you can actually see is that what it should look like are these normal dendritic spines. The dendrites are the parts of the um, uh, neurons that go out to communicate to a receptor. And it should look like this. And 
in Fragile X syndrome, what we see is there's too many immature spines and they're not very efficient. And what we've seen in the mouse model of Fragile X is that um, giving an mGluR5 antagonist, a glutamate blocker called CTEP, actually had some positive effects on both learning and memory in these mice. So if you see the um, gray and the light blue are the mice that got um, the drug here and they had um, better, higher learning um, than the m mice that didn't receive anything. Um, improvements in hyperactivity, so these lines are lower here, and then decreased hypersensitivity to auditory stimuli. And um, as far as human trials with mGluR5, uh, the first ones that were really published were in 2009 um, at the Mind Institute and also at Rush University in Chicago, looking at an mGluR5 antagonist called Phenobom. And that um, very small dose, uh, just 12 adults looking at just one dose, did show a fast response of physiological changes, so changes in PP. PPI, um, which Andrea will be showing us in the second session, um, and also in behavior. So due to those positive effects, there have been some now interest in other companies looking at both at mGluR5 antagonists from Roche and from Novartis. So um, at the Mind Institute right now, we are currently still doing the double-blind placebo-controlled trial of the mGluR5 antagonist through Roche, and then Novartis is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial as well as an open-label trial. So uh, double-blind placebo control, meaning that there's an equal chance that someone might be on placebo or a sugar pill versus um, actually getting the active medication. And those that continue on to open-label, it means that everyone continuing the study is actually getting active medication. Um, another interesting uh, effect that we've seen, this is from the Novartis study that was published in 2011, um, is that there are some differential responses to the medication. So this is the AFQ056 from Novartis, and that you see here, this is improvement, um, those who were on medication versus those that weren't. And almost everyone who was who had Fragile X syndrome and was fully methylated, meaning that uh, most of their genes are turned off so that they're making even less protein than those who are partially methylated, um, they tended to have a pretty consistent good response, a decrease in symptoms, whereas you see that this is um, very heterogeneous. Some people did better on the medication, some people didn't do any differently versus placebo, and some did even worse on the medication. And so there's some suggestion that in the um, mouse models that the mGluR5 antagonists can be helpful. And so here you see an mGluR5 antagonist called MPEP, and with increasing doses here, we see decreases in repetitive behaviors. So self-grooming is what we see in the mice. Um, and then increases in mouse social behaviors, so nose-to-nose -nose sniffing and social contact. So the individuals who had, the mice who had uh, received medication are here on the right-hand side, and you see much more in these two bars than you do in the, the dark blue. Um, and then decreases, so lower bars here compared to the darker bars in the repetitive behaviors. So because of some of those early uh, animal studies, there's suggestions that this may be helpful for autism. Moving on to the inhibitory side, so the GABA agonists. Our baclofen is one that's uh, currently um, been looked at through Seaside Therapeutics. Um, and our baclof baclofen itself, so it comes in two versions, an R and an S version, and they're really two um, different uh, orientations for it, basically. What's currently on the market is just a plain baclofen that's used for treating spasticity and cerebral palsy um, and other um, stiffness disorders. And our baclofen is now the investigational medication we're looking at in both Fragile X syndrome and autism, but it's not something that's currently on the market. Um, the reason for choosing the R isomer is because it has more potency um, at the GABA receptor than does the S receptor or the combination of both, which is what regular baclofen is. Um, so here's just a depiction to try to help show um, what's going on here at a synapse. If we see a presynaptic or the communicating um, 
neuron, then with the, res the receiving one here getting the message, what's going on when you don't have a lot of fMRP around is that you have excessive or too much activity here from the glutamate receptor causing a lot of protein over here. Um, and the way that our baclofen works is kind of working at the presynaptic or the sending out side um, to help decrease the amount that's going over to the receiving neuron and then decrease that glutamate pathway here and then normalize protein levels. So the trial that happened at the MIND Institute involved children ages 5 to 25 years of age with Fragile X syndrome and they were treated for a period of four weeks. Um, it was a double blind study so both the people, the families and the children as well as the clinicians weren't aware of who was on placebo or who wasn't and because this was a crossover trial it meant that every individual got both um, the medication as well as placebo. So if you started on our baclofen, then you got placebo for the second arm of the study. Or if you started on placebo, then you got our baclofen. So you, if you participated in the study, you knew at least some point you were getting exposed to the medication. Um, and this involved a wider range of individuals, ages 6 to 40 years of age, with a maximum dose of 10 milligrams uh, three times a day. And this data was published in 2012 um, by Liz Berry Kravis over at Rush. And these were the results there. So there were 63 subjects from the two centers. And their primary endpoint, so what they were hoping to show uh, by giving the arbaclofen was that there would be decreases in irritability as measured by the ABC or aberrant behavior checklist. They didn't find any differences in the ABC irritability scale based on those people who got the arbaclofen versus those who didn't. However, there was some suggestion that it did seem to help some of the social behaviors. So if you look at here a measure of improvement from a clinician rater, it's um, the CGI stands for the Clinical Global Impression Improvement Scale and it's basically a seven point scale that goes from very much worse to no change to very much improved. And what we consider kind of a good response or a preferable response is anyone who's in the much improved to very much improved category. Um, so of those people who did respond to the medication, so the subgroup of 52 people, uh, more people who took our baclofen, 35% versus 18% were in this very much or much improved rating, although this was not statistically significant. If you look at the subset of uh, children, individuals, because there were some adults here too, um, with autism, so 18, a very small number, but there were very more um, people who had the arbaclofen, 44% in the very much or much improved category versus only 6% of those who are on placebo. And then using the same ABC, the aberrant behavior checklist, the social avoidance scale, so those who were poor in their social skills to begin with, um, those people also seem to respond better to the arbaclofen, 58% versus 19%. And that was statistically significant as well. Um, so in autism, there's also been studies, uh, including uh, those at the MIND Institute, looking at um, our baclofen for children with autism spectrum disorders. The first one I'll tell you about was an open label treatment, so there was no placebo control, which is difficult because uh, just by nature of getting uh, a medication, the placebo effect can be quite high. So um, you have to take kind of results with the grain of salt until you see the randomized controlled trial. But this was kind of a first pass to see if um, this was a medication that could be tolerated by people with autism spectrum disorders and if it was something that would be safe and possibly effective. So um, this included, again, really looking at the outcome measure of irritability here, um, children ages 6 to 17 years of age. And there were 32 individuals and it was a little bit difficult to um, stay in the study because you couldn't be on more than two psychoactive medications. So um, if anyone was on an antipsychotic, they either had to choose to go off of it or not be part of the study. The treatment period was for eight weeks and results from that study showed improvements in many areas. So looking at that irritability, that decreased from baseline to after eight weeks of treatment. Again, there was no placebo control. Um, social withdrawal as measured on the ABC also went down. Um, total scores for aberrant behaviors went down, so there was improvement reported there. Um, the clinician rated improvement as well as severity got better. Um, and measures of ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, those also improved significantly. The Cybox measures uh, repetitive behaviors and obsessive tendencies, that improved. Um, anxiety and social responsiveness also responded well and so did communication uh, in this open label study. 
Um, so we just talked about our baclofen, which works at the GABA B receptor. Um, Ganaxalone is another study that's currently underway. Um, Dr. Hagerman and Dr. Ray Lozano are conducting that study over at the Mind Institute, and that works at the GABA A receptor as an agonist, so activating that site. Um, we know that GABA A is decreased that activity in Fragile X syndrome. And so we know that from mouse models, and that's the rationale for attempting to use uh, ganaxalone, which is a medication that's currently available, but it's used more for ep epilepsy and infantile spasms. It's a neurosteroid, um, and we're now looking at it um, for use in Fragile X syndrome to see if it helps with any of those Fragile X-related behaviors. Um, we're enrolling children ages 6 to 18 years of age, and this is a double-blind crossover trial, um, seven weeks of treatment and placebo, and what we're hoping to find is um, improvements in anxiety, behavior, and seizure frequency. We don't have any results published yet. We're still enrolling uh, patients into that trial, so stay tuned. Maybe next year we'll be able to give you an update. Uh, minocycline is the next medication we're going to be looking at. And many of you may know minocycline or be familiar with it because it's an antibiotic that's often used to treat infections, also used to treat acne. It works very well for that. Um, but the reasons we're interested in looking at minocycline and Fragile X syndrome and autism is for the anti-inflammatory properties as well as the neuroprotective properties. So if you remember from Irva's keynote talk today, there is some evidence to suggest that there may be some inflammatory processes that are leading to changes in the brain or in the rest of the body that are then leading to autism. Um, so that's why the, the rationale for choosing a medication like this. Um, some other factors that are that strengthen uh, why this might be a plausible medication to use is that in um, Fragile X syndrome you have weak connections and you see high levels of this marker, which is matrix metallopeptidase 9, it's a protein, and minocycline has been shown to actually lower those levels, so hopefully also normalizing some of the um, imbalances that are present in Fragile X syndrome. Um, it also has some antioxidant properties um, and um, helps decrease cell death or apoptosis. So um, it's currently being investigated in both Fragile X syndrome and in autism. Um, it lowers MMP9 levels, as I just mentioned, and in mouse models, it's improved uh, behavior as well as cognition. Um, those pictures that I showed about those dendritic spines have actually were related to uh, minocycline. So you actually see changes in the way that the um, dendrites are formed um, after administration of a minocycline to mice. So um, kind of the early studies include a parent survey. This was from the Mind Institute of um, children who were taking minocycline. 70% uh, of parents thought they saw a positive response when that child was on medication. It wasn't a controlled trial. This was just kind of anecdotal responses. Um, but they were especially uh, seeing benefits in language. And then um, in a study of older children, ages 13 and over, there was an, also another open label trial, uh, this one in Toronto, also showing some positive effects. Um, there's currently a study in autism using minocycline in children with regression, so children who have lost milestones. Uh, mostly we think about language milestones, but it could be other ones as well, social or motor. Um, and Sue Suido's the PI of that. That's an open label study of children ages 3 to 12 years of age. So since minocycline's been around for a while, something that's on the market, we do know a lot about what to expect as far as side effects. And they can be quite common. So in m many clinical trials, anywhere from 12 to 80% of people will have side effects. Most of them are mild, even though they're common. Um, things that that includes is gastrointestinal upset, loose stools, um, dizziness or a sense of vertigo. Uh, sun sensitivity is also a common side effect, so if anyone's taking this medication, it's important to protect yourself from the sun and use sunblock. Um, and then a uh, cosmetic um, side effect is graying or disdaining of the teeth as well as nails, which is um, undesirable, but just cosmetic. Um, some, for the clinicians out there, some other things to look out for that are rare but quite serious would be um, autoimmune-related conditions, so things that look like lupus or uh, autoimmune hepatitis, so that's affecting the liver. Um, there can be increase in intracranial pressure or drug reactions or hypersensitivity syndromes, although these are infrequent, but something to look out for, be aware of, and monitor. 
So Mary J. Lee, who is one of our um, faculty members, she's a pediatrician at the Mind Institute, conducted a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial of minocycline in children with fragile X syndrome. This was published uh, this year in the Journal of Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics. Um, and this involved children with fragile X syndrome, ages three and a half years of age to 16 years of age. And the treatment uh, was for a long period of time, three months on each arm, placebo and minocycline. Um, and the dosing was based on weight, so anywhere from 25 milligrams a day to 100 milligram, milligrams a day. Um, and here they were the three visits. They were either on placebo and then minocycline or minocycline and then placebo. This occurred over uh, basically two years. Um, and again, looking at that CGI, the Clinical Global Impression Scale, the clinician rated improvement, there was a significant difference of those who were on minocycline, so the blue bars here, uh, greater percentage of them were much improved or very much improved versus those on placebo. Other results from that study, she found that anxiety and mood improved in those children who were taking minocycline, um, although aggression, ADHD, and language or cognition, which is what the parents had kind of been telling us, um, they didn't see any differences, at least in this six-month trial. Um, there were other various uh, miscellaneous areas that people saw, parents saw improvements in, so organization or self-soothing, um, non-compliance and self-injury. So those were another hodgepodge of, of symptoms, but those were um, significantly different. Um, and then adverse events, so they were quite frequent. 82% had an adverse event, although it was similar between minocycline and placebo, about half of people whether they were on drug or not, had side effects. Um, most commonly seen was diarrhea or loose stools. That was common in around the same amount, 20%, in both minocycline and placebo. Um, in headaches, drowsiness, GI upset, the things that we'd known to look for. Um, I guess what's interesting here is that uh, discoloration of the teeth or the nails, that um, it wasn't different between the groups, 4% versus 1%, but that there was even someone on placebo who had a discoloration of the teeth. Um, that was seen by the clinician too, it wasn't just a report from the, um, from the parent. Um, and then sunburn, watching out for these things, but basically pretty much the same occurrence in both groups. So some considerations. Um, if anyone's taking minocycline to use a probiotic, that can often help mitigate the loose stools or diarrhea that you often see as a side effect. Um, it's good to try to um, avoid milk when you're taking it, at least an hour uh, between doses if you can. Um, for young children, it can be hard to get a very small dose, like the 25 milligrams that she had used. So um, what's nice is that usually minocycline comes in capsules as opposed to a pill. If you can break that open and then half of it can be put in applesauce or peanut butter or something as a vehicle to get that in. Um, and then obviously if there were any concerning symptoms, rash, swollen joints, things that look like autoimmune disease, lupus, or um, severe headaches, those should se seek medical attention and stop the medication. Um, and because of that concern about that drug-induced lupus or some autoimmune phenomenon, um, we do recommend checking the ANA, which is an anti-nuclear antibody. It's a blood marker for nonspecific, but would be suggestive of autoimmune processes. Checking that every six months um, and if there are any changes um, uh, with medication. If any of those titers go up, uh, kind of reevaluating whether it's helping and whether um, the benefits would outweigh the risks of continuing on medication. So other medications that we can talk about, um, sertraline that um, is also being looked at in Fragile X syndrome, um, as opposed to just treating you know, anxiety, we're also looking at if it helps with any of the more core symptoms. So here specifically, this is looking at language, both um, expressive language on top, so what children produce in their language, and receptive language down here, what they understand. Um, and this is a retrospective study, so not a controlled study, of 45 children, pretty young, ages 12 to 50 months of age, um, really comparing 11 children who were on sertraline versus 34 who weren't. And you can see the tendency here is with the older ages, you see a trend up or improvement in your language scores, both expressive and receptive, on those who were taking sertraline versus those who had no treatment. So there's some suggestion that uh, altering some of the serotonin pathways can be helpful for learning and or language, at least in, in children with fragile X syndrome. 
Um, Memantine, we did a study of Memantine uh, that was um, d uh, sponsored by Forest Laboratories a couple years ago, and this also works at the glutamate receptor on a different pathway. It's something that's currently um, being used for Alzheimer's disease and not for children, or, but this is something that's been popular and there have been some uh, controlled studies looking at it in uh, autism. So um, in this study, we saw children with autism ages 6 to 12 years of age, and you know, the primary outcome measure is trying to look at this, look at this for use as a targeted treatment. So does it help the social behaviors? Um, and the social responsiveness scale, which is one uh, questionnaire that's used to kind of evaluate for autism symptoms, it really didn't show any differences in that primary outcome measure for memantine. Um, there is some suggestion, it hasn't been published yet, we'll have to wait and see that maybe um, a different measure, so this is a combination of a clinician, rater, as well as um, some history of the cats, um, looking at autism symptoms again, that there may be some suggestions in a subgroup of people, it helped, but overall, looking at the entire group, there wasn't a difference, unfortunately, um, for memantine in the study sponsored by Forrest. So I'm just gonna conclude by the statement I made earlier. I think it's very exciting to be thinking about um, some medicines and pharmaceutical interventions that can help remodel the brain, help us learn better, help us decrease autism symptoms, but it's really important that these targeted treatments have to be combined with educational programs. Um, you're not gonna learn to read on your own if you don't have instruction, if you don't have books, if you don't learn the alphabet. So um, these things don't happen without a human component to it and without an interaction. So if synaptic connections are gonna be improved with these targeted treatments, we have to help these connections with the educational interventions. Um, and just like was mentioned in the earlier ADHD talk, perhaps it's the combination of the treatments that we really need to look at, not just looking at them separately. So using the medications with the educational interventions or some assistive technology and computer programs or CogMed, which is a, a computer-based um, intervention system that's supposed to help with um, working memory and um, other assistive devices. Um, those things, I think, are really promising and should, we'll hopefully have some data on in the near future. And with that, um, I wanted to leave you with some resources for anyone who has um, family members or clients, patients that may be interested in participating in any of our clinical trials. This is the website for all of the studies. You can put in um, diagnosis and age and then see what studies are currently happening. Um, we also have a lot of studies that aren't intervention studies. Uh, so I know a lot of people are hesitant about e trying medications. There are others that are either um, intervention-based behaviorally or just observational. And um, it's, we, we thank everyone who takes the time to come to the Mind Institute and really contribute to the research that we do there. It, it's so helpful. Um, this is the website for the Fragile X Research and Treatment Center. And then I also included the clinicaltrials.gov website because I think that's really important now that every clinical trial that's being done needs to be registered um, with the government so that we know if there are trials and there aren't results published, that we're aware of that because previously there is a lot of um, publication bias where we only hear about the medications that have success and we, we don't really know what the denominator is out of how many studies was it successful. So um, that's always good to try to look up any um, medication or drug that you're thinking about or interested in to see what kind of research has been done or is currently being done on that medication. Um, this is the article that Dr. Hagerman had written and that was included in your syllabus. It's also very helpful. It has a little review of conventional medications as well. Um, and then for um, some more complementary alternative treatments, this is a really great website uh, from the National Institutes of Health that summarizes you know, evidence base for certain um, non-conventional medications, whether they're herbs or supplements or other procedures like that. So that's also been a very helpful resource. Um, I want to say thanks again to Dr. Rondi Hagerman, Mary J. Lee, um, Andrea, who will be participating in the next um, talk, and then Norman Brule, who runs our clinical trials unit, and then obviously the whole team. It takes a, a large team um, to come up collaboratively with all of the research that we've been able to accumulate and present with you today. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. 
Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.